Today we celebrate in the church's liturgy two saints, actually, two French saints, two who, who were actually maybe only about 100 years apart. Saint Louis Grignon de Montfort, who was born in 1673 in, in uh, Montfort, France, and Saint Peter Chanel, who was born in Belly, France in 1803. So both of them are uh, not too far apart in history, but very close together in much more so in their spirituality. For both of them were members of a Marian movement. Saint Peter Chanel uh, was a diocesan priest and was given as his first assignment a rundown parish. And in three years, he totally revitalized it. And uh, he had the desire, though, to be a missionary. And uh, he couldn't do that as a diocesan priest, so he decided to become a member of the Society of Mary, which is known as the Marists. And uh, much to his dismay, when he joined them, they sent him to teach in the seminary. <laughs> he didn't get to be the missionary that he thought he was going to be, so he had to spend five years teaching in the seminary. And you might think, well, if he, out of irritation, he might do a poor job, but he did such a good job in teaching that eventually they allowed him to go and begin his missionary work, and they sent him to the new Hebrides. I don't know what part of that, what, what that country is called today, but the people there had just stopped practicing cannibalism before he came, so that was a good sign there. But uh, he was sent there and with eight other companions, and then they split up, and he, along with uh, another priest and an English layman, uh, preached to this to this area uh, where the king was very receptive to them at first. But then as St. Peter Chanel had learned the language and became more uh, conversant with the people, he was realizing that he was losing his influence, that the king was afraid that he was the high priest and the leader, and he thought that his influence and his his prestige was going to, was be, becoming lesser because he could see that the people were taking to this new religion and he wouldn't be the center of attention that he was before because, of course, God is going to become the center of their lives. And so out of anger, especially when his son, the king's son, asked if he could be baptized, he dispatched some warriors to go and kill uh, St. Peter Chanel and his companions. So he was martyred on this day in 1841. St. Louis Grignon de Montfort had a, a similar start. He started out as a diocesan priest. He was sent as his first, he was ordained in this, on the year 1700 and uh, was sent to a hospital to be the chaplain and he wanted, he tried to reform the practices there in the hospital. I guess it was not in a very good spiritual condition. And the people did not like his, his endeavor or weren't receptive to him and he had to resign. And you would think, well, with that failure, he probably would just be gone and not be ever heard of again in history. But instead, God had other designs for him. And of course, we know he had this great devotion, burning devotion to Our Lady. Even as a youth, he had this great devotion to Our Lady and it became the center of his preaching. He was named an apostolic, uh, uh, an apostolic missionary he, by the Pope. That means he could go anywhere in France and preach with his permission. And he went around spreading this strong devotion to our, our Blessed Mother called True Devotion to Our Lady and uh, preaching the rosary. And true devotion doesn't mean opposite of false. It means the most perfect. If you say someone is true blue or some, a color is true, it means it is perfect. It means it's, it's, it represents what blue is or represents most especially whatever that, uh, whatever we say something is true. So true devotion to Our Lady is what is this, the truest devotion. It is the most perfect expression of devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
And uh, of course, this idea of consecrating yourself to the Blessed Virgin Mary so that you can more perfectly follow Christ. And uh, he was so successful in his endeavors of spreading devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and, of course, writing his books, uh, Secret of Mary, Secret of the Rosary, uh, True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, that these have become spiritual classics and uh, probably helped <clears throat> revitalize that area of France known as the Vendée uh, with the faith, the Catholic faith. So well did he inspire them in the faith that when the French Revolution would come along, the Vendée is the only part of France that mounted any kind of resistance to the, to the godless French Revolution. Matter of fact, they almost defeated the godless uh, armies of the French Revolution, and they were just farmers and uh, simple peasants who were armed most of the time with pitchfork and farm implements. They didn't even have guns many times when they went into battle, uh, and they almost uh, defeated the uh, government forces of the of the uh, French Revolution. But even though they weren't successful, the faith that he had instilled in those people in the Vendée, especially their devotion to Our Lady, made them truly militant Catholics. They weren't going to just lay down and let the uh, godless secular society of France run over them. And they were going to put up a resistance. And even to this day, you'll find that that part of France still maintains uh, the Catholic faith better than other places in France because of this devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, that St. Louis de Montfort instilled in them. Um, St. Louis called this way of Our Lady, the true devotion, the immaculate way of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he was quite uh, zealous in his preaching of it. And he, would, he himself said, this about his devotion that he had preached. Uh, St. Louis says, uh, he called it a sweet and easy way, true devotion. And this author says about St. Louis, she hardly, looks like, she hardly looks like these dreadful roads that St. Louis de Marie de Montfort depicts to us under such black colors. In other words, the other roads that you can take to, to Christ are black compared to this sweet and easy way of Our Lady, in which St. Louis said, we must pass through obscure nights, through combats, through strange agonies, over craggy mountains, through cruel thorns, and over frightful deserts. We do find, it is true, great battles to fight and great hardships to master, but that good mother and mistress makes herself so present and so near to her faithful servants to enlighten them in their darknesses and their doubts, to strengthen them in their fears and to sustain them in their struggles and their difficulties, that in truth this virginal path to find Jesus Christ is a path of roses and honey compared with the other paths. And then he goes on to say uh, about this way of Our Lady, about consecrating yourself to her, because it is the immaculate way. He said, the happy child and slave of Mary, as long as he walks in it, does not sin. They that work by me shall not, shall not sin. From Ecclesiastes 24, verse 30. Fusing by obedience and dependence his will with the will of his mistress, how could he offend God? To sin, it is necessary for him to avoid Mary's direction and resume momentarily his independence for the guilty act. So in other words, if someone wants to offend and they want to be a child of Mary, they in one sense have to leave off the yoke of Mary for, for a moment and take up their own way if they're going to, to offend God. Because, of course, if they're truly living this true devotion to Our Lady and walking in her path, they won't do that. Finally, he says about uh, uh, Our Lady, he says that, you know, Our Lady is an army in battle array. And St. Louis has this to say about uh, this. He says, the enemies of good see that they are powerless against those who walk on Mary's road. They can yap and bark, but they do not bite. 
Mary protects her servants from temptations or helps them to overcome them. Saint Louis Marie de Montfort, thanks to her, to her to his tender devotion to the Blessed Virgin, crosses the period of youth which is so which is so disastrous for, for so many others, without knowing what a temptation against the beautiful virtue is. In other words, Saint Louis lived his whole youthful life without ever sinning against the virtue of purity because of his true devotion. If in other circumstances the devils have permission to attack him, it is only to suffer a more humiliating defeat. So the saint had the right to assure, reassure us by showing us Mary with us as an army arranged in battle. He said, Shall a man who has an army of a hundred thousand soldiers around him fear his enemies? A faithful servant of Mary, surrounded by her protection and her imperial power, has still less no f has still less to fear. His good mother and powerful princess, princess of the heavens would rather dispatch battalions of millions of angels to succor one of her servants than that it should ever be said that a faithful servant of Mary, who trusted in her, had to sub had had to succumb to the malice, the number, and the vehemence of his enemies. So that Our Lady will assist us in times of temptation, but we have to make use of her, uh, her good motherly protection. She gives us inspirations. She also will strengthen us in time of temptation if we will make use of it. He then says, you know, St. Louis says, you know, many people say, oh, there's different ways that we can get to our Lord. And he says this, he says, Make for me, if you will, a new road to go to Jesus and pave it with all the merits of the blessed, adorn it with all their heroic virtues, illuminate it and embellish it with all the lights and beauties of the angels, and let all the angels and saints be there themselves to escort, defend, and sustain those who are ready to walk there. And yet in truth, in simple truth, I say boldly, and I repeat that I say truly, I would prefer to this new perfect path, the Immaculate Way of Mary. So today as we honor these two saints, so these two Marian saints, one, both missionaries, one ending his life in a red martyrdom, uh, St. Peter Chanel, and the other, St. Louis de Montfort, just by living the life of grace and following Our Lady, uh, but you would say he died to himself, lived a white martyrdom. Uh, you know, they are two great lights for the church. And um, France is known for its perfume. You know, they say Chanel number five and all that. But I think the greatest perfume that France ever produces is the great saints. You know, the, what our Lord said about, or St. Peter, I think, or St. Paul says, let your lives be the sweet odor of Christ. You know, when we use incense in church, that's a reminder that, you know, even the odor of sanctity, that's the odor that we hope that we will, will all be uh, effusing when, when people meet us, that they will, as St. Paul says, the sweet odor of Christ. These two uh, saints of France, these two great Marian saints, they reflected this great o this sweet odor of Christ because of this great Marian devotion that they had, both living it out in the way that um, Our Lady used them to be her instruments. And let us pray today as we honor St. Peter Chanel and St. Louis Grignon de Montfort that we will embrace once again, renew our consecration to Our Lady because all consecration to Our Lady in one way or another, is, has the same aspects, total consecration, giving ourselves totally to Our Lady, and then in, in giving ourselves totally to her, then we can have that confidence, as St. Louis says, that she will give herself totally to us, to protect us, watch over us, but we have to stay in the path. We have to remain on the path. We can't wander off on some little side street or take our own little way, because every time we do, we end up in trouble. So let us uh, be mindful of that. And today as we 
uh, reflect on our consecration to Our Lady, whatever form we've made, whether it be the form of St. Louis or St. Maximilian or Blessed Shamanad, that we will uh, truly renew our efforts at being the faithful servants and devotees truly consecrated to Our Lady. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.